Hello, I'm John Sargent and welcome to Argumental, the show where the hottest names in comedy debate the biggest issues facing mankind. Issues such as, what do community support officers do that road signs can't? <laughs> Why have I never been Heat's torso of the week? <laughs> and will this email thing ever really take over from the facts? <laughs> Here to argue <laughs> and others like them are our teams. In the red corner with Marcus Brigstock this week, it's Will Smith. <laughs> and joining Rufus Hound in the blue corner, please welcome Jimmy Carr. Okay, let's kick off with round one where we debate a big issue I personally find so worrying that I can hardly get a wink of sleep during the day. Tonight, the subject under discussion is globalization. Globalization. Since man first touched a globe with a barrow, capitalism has been big business. Back in the 1800s, British goods ruled the world. But nowadays, it's a global marketplace. And we'll put up with getting our insurance via Bangalore as long as we can get our Primark t-shirts for 50 pence. They might be cutting costs, but the big brands are in the dock for using cheap kiddie labor. What's the problem? This little fella seems happy enough. <laughs> but the issue I want the team to argue over is this. Kids working in sweatshops are the lucky ones. <laughs> Proposing this statement on behalf of the blue team, it's Jimmy Carr. Yes. Uh, before I begin here, I should just declare an interest. Uh, ten pence from the sale of each one of my DVDs goes to the poor, underprivileged children of Cambodia, who manufacture them. <laughs> According to UNICEF, there are an estimated 158 million children under the age of 14 engaged in child labour worldwide. I know what you're thinking, that simply isn't enough. <laughs> Somewhere in the world, right now, there are grown men and women being forced to do things, back-breaking, degrading things, that you might as well get a child to do. <laughs> you don't have to pay them as much, they eat less and they need smaller coffins. It's win, 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 win. <laughs> The only tragedy of these children working in factories, they are the lucky ones, the only tragedy is that they're simply not good-looking enough to go on the game. <laughs> that is life, you've just got to face up to that. There, there will be some slightly controversial points I'll be making in a moment, I should prepare you for that. <laughs> that sharp intake of breath nearly created a fucking vacuum. <laughs> Man up, audience, come on. Um, the conditions in some of these factories are appalling, but whose fault is that? It's the kids' fault. It is. You know, if you've been in there since you were two and the place is a fucking state, have a tidy round. <laughs> Make a house at home. Meh, meh, meh. It's cold. The fumes are making me drowsy. I think she's dead. <laughs> Shut up and get back to work. Um, <clears throat> a lot of these kids think they haven't got a future, but they have. It's just an unremittingly bleak future. <laughs> These kids must enjoy their jobs. There's proof. If they didn't enjoy their jobs, they've got all the access they need to top-of-the-line trainers. <laughs> if they didn't like it, they would have slipped on a pair and been out of there <laughs> in some sort of record time. <laughs> these sweatshop jobs are so sought after, these kids have to go through a rigorous interviewing process. They're asked, where do you see yourself in five years? And, and, and the ones that get the jobs answer, well, either I'll be dead or eight. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> this is the case for sweatshops in the third world. <laughs> what were you hoping I was going to say? <laughs> Just a word of warning before I wrap things up, and I think I'm making a strong case for sweatshops really giving these kids hope. A word of warning, though. If we are going to end global poverty, now is the time to stock up on trainers. <laughs> I rest my case. Thank you, Jimmy. Next up, opposing the statement for the red team, it's Marcus Brigstock. Thank you very much, Jimmy, for those encouraging words. Uh, 
I have to admit, ladies and gentlemen, there is a small problem. I am dyslexic and I have prepared an argument against the use of children working in sweet shops. <laughs> Quite a lot of material about sherbet lemons, raspberry fizz bombs and Vince cables. Um, <laughs> But anyway, we'll, we'll work with what we've got. Um, the idea here is that children working in sweatshops are the lucky ones. But honestly, children at work. I mean, do you want to hear a six-year-old come back and have their four-year-old sibling say, good day at the office, dear, and have them go, well, Maureen from accounts was late again, I'm afraid. No, you want children to say silly things, and their heads to be full of daft ideas, like what my son said to me, because girls have no willy, when they wee, it goes all up the front. <laughs> He asked me, what's the biggest poo you've ever done? And then we spent the afternoon thinking of words that rhyme with fart. That's what children are for. Of course, there are some circumstances in which certain children would be better off working in a sweatshop. Imagine if you were a small child and woke up to realise that Kerry Katona was your mother. <laughs> You'd be immediately on the phone to Childline going, Hello, yeah, I was wondering if there's any chance I could work in a sweatshop. <laughs> I want to stitch trainers. I phone Childline, it's rubbish. They're not even real children. <laughs> we have no basis for comparison, you know? In, in this country, you move house, someone says, oh, I uh, hear you've moved recently, what are the schools like? And you say, well, they're pretty good, we've had to pretend to be Catholic, but it's not too bad. <laughs> you don't have people living in the slums in Delhi saying things like that, oh, I hear you've moved recently, what are the sweatshops like? Oh, much better, yes, we were very encouraged. Some of these children leave the sweatshop with eight or nine fingers. <laughs> and that is why kids working in sweatshops are not the lucky ones. Vote with the red team. Thank you. Thank you, Marcus. Rufus and Willis, anything you want to say in support of your teammates? The thing is, we're arguing that the kids working in sweatshops are the lucky ones. So why are they lucky? Well, you've got to ask what they'd be doing if they weren't in a sweatshop. Not dying. Yeah. Going to school. <laughs> School's rubbish, isn't it? <laughs> This is if you don't pay for it. Come <laughs> <laughs> on. I mean, we have loads of after-school activities. Yeah. Can you even play the harp? No. <laughs> Thank you all. So our kids working in sweatshops, the lucky ones. It's time for the studio audience to decide who made the best case. Hold up your blue cards if you agree with Jimmy and red for Marcus. Vote now. Are you looking at the blue side and then you've turned the wrong side? <laughs> OK, so that looks like a victory for the red team. Well done, Marcus and Will. <laughs> They've convinced our audience that kids working in sweatshops are not the lucky ones. Yes, it's horrible to picture a young Chinese girl running her tiny fingers along the seams of my new underpants. <laughs> Does he even know what he's saying? Right. <laughs> our next round is called Flip Flop, where we find out how well our teams can argue with themselves. I'm going to give one member of each team a statement which they must support until they hear this sound. At which point they must perform a U-turn and argue against it, then flip flop backwards and forwards every time I press the buzzer. Will and Rufus will play this one. Rufus, you're up first. And I'd like you to start off by arguing that everyone should be allowed a face transplant. <laughs> of course everybody should be allowed a face transplant. A face transplant is something that you have to have if your face has been ripped off. <laughs> well, lots of people want to go to hospital <laughs> with a ripped off face. People whose faces are so contorted by generations of inbreeding. People whose, you know, privilege has bought them very little, but not, you know, sort of any kind of great physical endowment. <laughs> Those sorts of people should not be allowed a face transplant. That privilege should not be granted to them. <laughs> Imagine uh, Marcus gets into a horrible accident, he survives, but he has my face transplanted. There afterwards, everything he says would come out of my mouth. <laughs> I can only allude to the things Marcus has tried to put in this mouth. <laughs> Don't let his words be one of them. There's only, I think, been one actual face transplant, I think I'm right in saying. It was a French woman who had had her face chewed off by a dog. <laughs> Nobody wants their face chewed off by a dog, which is why Peter Andre got divorced. It should... 
And that is why everyone should be allowed a face transplant. Vote blue! Oh. Hey. Thank you, Rufus. Well flip-flop. Thank you, John. Some people are born without a face, others, like me, are born with slightly too much of one. <laughs> Surely the best thing about having a face transplant would be turning up at the donor's funeral and going, ooh. <laughs> you definitely would, wouldn't you? <laughs> well, you're up next. I'd like you to begin by arguing that reality show stars are real stars. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, like you mean it. <laughs> of course reality stars are real stars. It's easy to become a star if you're like Paul McCartney. He's great at writing brilliant songs. It's much harder if you're Peter Andre and you look like an underwear model with learning difficulties. <laughs> <laughs> I hate all reality stars. <laughs> Television used to be full of people like me. The idiot children of the landed classes. Not tough enough for the army, not gay enough for the church. But I love <laughs> Now it's like the barn doors have been opened and the animals are shitting in the house. <laughs> well, I've had enough. <laughs> Reality stars are disgusting. We should harvest their brains and feed them to pigs. <laughs> what higher honour could we accord <laughs> these fantastic stars than by feeding the brain, the, the very symbol of the soul, to the most beloved of farmyard animals. <laughs> Our reality stars show us a journey. I imagine a world without Ben Fogel. <laughs> what is the function of that man? That man is basically too scared to come out of the closet, so he has to engineer these ridiculous scenarios where he's off with James Cracknell at the South Pole or rowing nude across the Atlantic. <laughs> Except it's great when you see them develop a skill like, like ice dancing or, 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 or ballroom dancing. I mean, you know, look at John Sargent on Strictly Come Dancing. He was just brilliant. It was, fa it was so bad he had to resign. It would, and, and that was appalling because I wanted to see more of him. Um, <laughs> and, and that's what it's about. I mean, you know, like, like, like the, the X Factor. It's fantastic, the X Factor. And, and Britain's Got Talent is wonderful. It's uh. wonderful. It just turns this country into one big butlins. <laughs> Thank you. Exactly, star Danny Minogue is looking much hotter lately. Back up there with Kylie. So, Danny, if you're watching good news, my offer of a Minogue sisters three-way is back on the table. <laughs> Susan Boyle gets a hard time, but I think she's a good-looking fella. <laughs> she's actually quite sad. She's got a personality disorder that makes it very difficult for her to get on with other people. She's, um, she's Scottish. There are so many of those useless shows, like, like Shipwrecked. That was Andy Peters' Island of Gay Children, wasn't it? <laughs> That's something very different that you... No, no, no. Oh, no, I need I that DVD that... back, mate. He produced that. <laughs> <laughs> OK, time for the studio audience to decide who flipped and who flopped. If you thought Rufus flip-flopped best about face transplants, <laughs> vote blue. But if you thought Will flip-flopped best about reality show stars, then vote red. So, it's blue cards for Rufus or red cards for Will. Vote now. Lovely. Lovely. Are you sure you know her? Yes. Oh. <laughs> so, a red majority there. Commiserations to Rufus, but congratulations to Will. Join us after the break when we'll be finding out whether everyone should go gay at least once in their life and if Derek Cora has genuine psychic powers. Don't go away. <laughs> Welcome back to Argumental, the quarrel-tastic show that, in my opinion, should have been called Bicker Nuts. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I had that once. Really itchy, mm. isn't it? <laughs> Right, next up is Slideshow. One member of each team will again be debating a controversial issue, but this time I want them to illustrate their argument using a random series of pictures. Jimmy and Marcus, you're up for this one. Jimmy, I'd like you to start by arguing that everyone should go gay at least once in their life. <laughs> I think this suit is argument enough. Um, <laughs> I think you should try everything once. Stretch yourself. <laughs> Are they checking to see if the other one swallowed? 
much of you worse than that. I hope they've got some Viagra. <laughs> like trying to pick a lock with a marshmallow. Uh, <laughs> Biscuits. <laughs> Tea bagging. <laughs> Biscuits should be hard with a delicious filling. Um, <laughs> but they can go soft once they've been dunked. <laughs> I met some ugly queens in my time. <laughs> Royalty. I don't see what that would have to do with uh, Prince Edward. He's a happily married man, but one day, who knows, he might choose to try experimenting with gay sex. It could be, could be today, could be tomorrow, could be yesterday, could be 17 years ago. <laughs> could be all of the above. Uh. Bashing the bishop. <laughs> the thing that used to annoy me about Catholic Church was the standing up, the sitting down, the kneeling. I wish you could just pick a position and fuck me. <laughs> I'm proud to say I've spent a frenzied night of passion with a couple of gays. I believe they call them lesbians. <laughs> and I got them both back on solids. <laughs> Thanks, Jimmy. Marcus, I'd like you to argue the opposite, that everyone should not go gay at least once in their life. Here's your first picture. Right. OK. Oh, hello. <laughs> Very hard to argue with that there, isn't it? Uh, well, you know... <laughs> I think we should define what going gay is. I mean, are we talking about going to see Mamma Mia and buying some curtains, or are we talking about a good stiff bumming? Because I know which I prefer, and I certainly don't like musicals. <laughs> a lot of animals are gay. Uh, for example, Dale Winton. <laughs> who is pictured here with some grass hanging out of his mouth, <laughs> which makes uh, a change from the usual cock and poor scripts. <laughs> so, uh, this is a chart representing the, um, representing the interest in gayness shown by the Reds and the Blue Teams. As you can see, the Blue Team spiked with interest the moment they spotted John Sargent. <laughs> and then, as you can see, it shot up since this conversation began, whereas for Will and I, it's been fairly consistent until I stood up and Will caught sight of my bottom, from which time it has declined massively. <laughs> you shouldn't go gay once. Um, uh, unless you're Peter Andre. In which case, it would have saved you a quite phenomenal amount of trouble. Frankly, I would rather have a lifetime of rather violent anal sex than I would spend even five minutes in the company of that evil, twisted bitch. <laughs> Thanks, Marcus. Rufus and right. Will, would you like to add anything to this debate? If we want to win this, and we're arguing that you should go gay at least once... Because <laughs> we're, we're sort of two points behind, so probably be... <laughs> if we do, I just feel that... <laughs> It's fine. Whoa, whoa, whoa. I, I remembered I went gay just before lunch. Oh, I'm no. I'm full, but thank you. Not everybody should go gay. I mean, there are certain people who could spoil gayness forever, aren't there? I mean, if you read, for example, that John McCririck had gone gay oh. for a day, even Graham Norton would go, that's it, I resign. <laughs> I think they'd see a challenge. <laughs> I think they'd see that hat with the little grips on the back and go, I could use that. <laughs> So, should everyone go gay at least once in their life? It's time for our studio audience to decide who made the best case. It's a blue card for Jimmy, who says yes, and a red one for Marcus, who says no. Vote now. Oh, well, finally, they get a hang of it. Finally. Thanks very much. I don't know. And maybe some of those young boys there making eyes at me. Clear <laughs> victory for the Blues. Well done, Jimmy. I've never had any gay experiences because, as it says in the Bible, trannies don't count. <laughs> it's on to our popular culture run now, where tonight's debate is all about TV psychics. 
Psychics, those ghost-bothering, table-tapping widow warriors, have become scarily popular on the other side, the Living Channel. Armed with a night vision camera, they'll hunt down your dead gran in the name of entertainment. R.I.P. Gran, now you're on TV. The ghost finder general is Derek Acora, a man with more voices in his head than an angry lorry driver. But there's nothing creepy about Derek. She does love you. She loves you to bits. <laughs> You've just seen him, and the statement I want you to argue is this. Derek Acora has genuine psychic powers. Rufus. <laughs> Now, we know that there are ghosts and spirits, that's a given. Otherwise, we wouldn't have called them ghosts if they didn't exist. <laughs> so it's got a name, it exists. Name something that doesn't exist. You can't, right? <laughs> it's worth remembering as well, Derek Acora not only can speak to ghosts, a force for good. Because he only ever talks to the good ghosts, doesn't he? He's always like, what's that you say? He says he's very safe, mother, and you've nothing to worry about. He never goes, what's that? He's saying, oh, I'll tell you what he's saying. He's saying, ah! I'm on fire! Ah! Oh, for fuck's sake, go to church! Go to church! Ah! <laughs> and we know hell exists because we have a name for it. So, <laughs> vote blue because your grandma wants you to vote blue. <laughs> your goldfish wants you to vote blue. Oh, so Harry Seacombe and Jade Goody both want you to vote blue. <laughs> Princess Diana, Henry VIII and Bruce Forsyth, they all... <laughs> Is he not dead yet? He might be by the time this is broadcast. <laughs> Cora has genuine psychic powers. It cannot be doubted. Vote blue. It would be mental not to. I thank you. Well done. Next up, opposing Rufus and arguing that Derek Cora does not have genuine psychic powers, it's Will Smith. I don't know how anyone can be convinced by this man. I saw one show where he did a reading on a dog. And what he said was, this dog's telling me it likes to go for walks. <laughs> that's not reading an animal's mind, that's knowing a fact about dogs. <laughs> Spirits can travel anywhere they like. We know that from Rent-A-Ghost. <laughs> if I was a disembodied spirit, I would rather spend eternity with Satan and all of his demons than listen to dreary scouse whimsy from this gimp. <laughs> I want to point out, I'm not saying that I think he is a liar because he is Scouse. <laughs> I'm not saying that. <laughs> I'm just saying it doesn't help. <laughs> okay. okay. I mean, why, if you were a spirit and you wanted to convince people that you, you were communicating with them, you'd do that through somebody beloved and respected and loved, like Stephen Fry or Richard Dawkins. You're not someone who looks like he ran a strip club in the 50s. <laughs> <laughs> the only person... <laughs> that this man ever talks to regularly, the only spirit he ever talks to regularly, is his spirit guide, Sam. Now, Derek claims to have met Sam 2,000 years ago in Ethiopia. Derek claims he grew up in Africa in a previous life, where his family were farmers. Uh, one day, Derek was uh, tending the fields when marauders came and burnt down the village, slaughtered everyone there. Sam found Derek hiding and took him under his wing, and together they travelled many lands. Now, I don't mean to be cynical about this heartbreaking story, but it's exactly the same as the opening ten minutes of Conan the Barbarian. <laughs> In short, to sum up, there is only one white-haired man with magical powers that I believe in. That is Gandalf, and that is not him. <laughs> Vote Red! Thanks, Will. Marcus and Jimmy, would you like to add anything in support of your teammates? I think one of the ways that you know for sure that he hasn't seen or been able to communicate with any ghosts is that that's not possible. <laughs> <laughs> 
No, listen. I'm doing it right now. The thrust of your <laughs> the thrust I of your right argument now was to say with a ghost. that anything that has a name exists. Yeah. But your dignity has a name. <laughs> <laughs> and yet here we all are. <laughs> I'm, I'm normally quite cynical, but I do genuinely believe that the, the souls of the recently departed can communicate with greedy charlatans. <laughs> <laughs> I think it can happen. Thank you all. So does Derek Acora have genuine psychic powers? Once again, the studio audience will decide who made the best case. It's a blue card for Rufus and Jimmy, who think Derek Acora is the real thing. <laughs> and does indeed have an Ethiopian spirit guide named Sam. <laughs> And a red one for Will and Marcus, who think he's a fake and that Sam probably isn't even Ethiopian. <laughs> Vote now. Oh, come on. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so, it's a win for the Reds. Well done, Will and Marcus. Good work, my friend. They've convinced the audience that Derek Okora does not have genuine psychic powers. Derek Akora describes himself as a top spiritualist and psychic, which, as job titles go, has as much validity as calling yourself the greatest judo tambourine horse. <laughs> <laughs> so, at the end of that round, Marcus and Will are well ahead. <laughs> Time now for the final round and a last chance for our teams to show just how argumental they really are. I'm going to show them a series of images. All they have to do is suggest an argument that the picture is proving. So, here's the first one. <laughs> Whoa, that's an argument for extreme bingo. <laughs> <laughs> an argument against Grand's Hatch. <laughs> oh, Grand's Hatch sounds awfully rude. <laughs> <laughs> Next one. Is it the argument that if given the opportunity, not everybody would travel back in time to save the life of Princess Diana? <laughs> oh, shame. One of these two things has had a strange looking creature inside it, wiggling. <laughs> <laughs> wiggling around with a weird, creepy voice. <laughs> and the other is a Dalek. <laughs> Next one. There's a gentleman's club on the other side of that wall. <laughs> and that's like above a fireplace. <laughs> <laughs> I would just say it's very well hung. <laughs> like a horse. <laughs> OK, that's it. So, for the final time, it's down to our studio audience to decide who made the best case. Red for Marcus and Will, and blue for Rufus and Jimmy. Vote now. Oh, well, you know what? Yeah, well done. <laughs> so, I can tell you that the blue team have won that round, but nevertheless, that still means the overall winners tonight are the red team. <laughs> well done, Marcus Brigstock and Will Smith. Commiserations to Rufus Hound and Jimmy Carr. That's all we've got time for. Good night. And there's more brand new Argumental next Tuesday with Chris Addison and Katie Brand here on Dave. And if you head to the web, you can watch clips, outtakes and behind-the-scenes videos from Argumental at joindave.co.uk.